Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Cricket Weekly podcast. New Zealand have whitewashed India and beyond being one of the most incredible results in test history, it's put the World Test Championship on a knife edge with five teams still in the hunt for the final. So this week we'll be getting deep into that competition and the state of the test game as a whole. And with me to discuss it are Phil Walker and South African freelance journalist Dan Gallen. Dan, good to have you back on. It's been it's been a while. I think two or three South Africa World Cup heartbreaks ago. Um, how you been? Yeah, I'm uh, numb now <laughs> as a consequence. But uh, yeah, great to be back. Uh, loving the new space. Yeah, no, it's it's, a, it's pretty cozy in here. Yeah. Um, okay, we will get into the World Championship, but first, let's get the England cricket stuff sort of out the way. Uh, after Liam Livingston's side lost 2-1 in their ODI series in the Caribbean, I caught up with Mark Butcher, who's out in Barbados. Butch, I thought the deal was England could only be good at one format at a time, but at the moment, they aren't great at either. There, there are kind of green shoots for England in this series, which we might get to, but overall, it was, it's been a pretty chastening three games, hasn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, at the outset, my feeling was that if the West Indies didn't beat us at home with a, with a team with four debutants in it and, uh, you know, and Sean of a lot of the, the sort of number one team, um, a team where Adil Rashid is not only the, the leading wicket taker, highest amount of caps and the leading run scorer, you're kind of <laughs> thinking, well, you know, you, you, you've got your work cut out for you a little bit. And so result wise, not entirely surprised that we that we didn't win the series um and also you know the the two the two venues that the games were played at have such a, a wildly skewed preference for the team chasing winning the winning the game um it, it was kind of you know the the, to, the the games played out to the toss really didn't they in terms of you know batting being um relatively difficult or at least set out in a way where if you batted first, you needed to kind of survive the first 10 to 15 overs without losing too many wickets in order then to post something that was kind of a roundabout par for the venue, but that that par was always a losing par, <laughs> you know? So uh, the, the, the second game being the, um, and, and not because England won it, because it was a genuinely enjoyable game of cricket, you know, West Indies getting 328, some brilliance from, from their captain, Shea Hope, his 17th um, ODI 100. He's a proper proper player um and then you know Livingston and Curran with that partnership where they soaked up a bit of pressure in the middle and then smashed it to, to all hell in, at the end was a was a was a genuinely entertaining game um a cricket the other two not so much England were were desperate in the in the first game with the bat to get knocked over for 209 where 280 was 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 certainly within their reach and then in the second game uh, 10 overs gone 24 for four you're utterly screwed um, and despite a, a, what I thought was a brilliant innings from Phil Salt um, to kind of get get himself and get the team to sort of uh, with, with 10 overs to go and the chance of a bit of an onslaught, only five down, um, you know, even even when that came, um, thanks to Mosley and, uh, and, and Jamie Overton, um, you, you're still unbelievably short when you come out and the first two balls are gun barrel straight and go flying to the boundary and you think, oh, here we go. Uh, and that's the end of it. So unsatisfying, I think, is the, is the way to put it over the course of the series. But with a, with a lot of good plus points, I suppose, for for some of the some of the younger players, and um, a lot of a lot of real plus points for the West Indies as well, who are battling away trying to get automatic qualification for um, for the twenty seven World Cup. I do want to talk about the batting, but actually, I feel like there is quite a lot of focus on England's batters because you know that's where you can talk about. They're all so young; they haven't played much fifty over cricket. There's quite a lot to you know, there's a lot else in English cricket that means people want to talk about that. But actually, if you look at that bowling attack for, say, the third ODI, that's, you know, Jofra Archer, Adil Rashid, Reese Topley, that's not far off being close to a full-strength England attack. And, you know, they took four wickets across the two defeats. Is that conditions? Is that guys kind of feeling their way a bit back into it, not enough on the board to defend? Or is there, like, is the bowling is also a concern as well as the batting kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, all of, all of those, all of the above count. Um, for sure, I sort of I had had the feeling that um, that Jofra, um, if if we go with him first, uh, that in the in the first and second ODI sort of had showed signs of kind of like finding some of his some of his best form, and that a bag of wickets was just around the corner. Um, but but he, he conditions changing with the new ball aside, um, he was sort of worryingly. Um, 
two lengths yesterday. Couldn't didn't really lock into a to a decent length at all um, during the game yesterday. And that's you know, and that's with the mitigating factors of the of the conditions having changed quite a lot um, over the course of the of the two innings. So that was a, not a concern, but it was just it was surprising that he was that he was so either very full or sort of like a a, a very playable um, short of a length um, yesterday. Uh, Reese Topley looked a little short of a gallop. Um, you know his first game. Since uh, since the English summer, Sam Curran as a as a bowler in in T twenties, we we kind of we we touched on in ODI. Sorry, we touched on this during that during that World Cup in terms of the fact that as a as a bowler, if he isn't bowling in the with the with the brand new ball in ODIs, he becomes very ineffective. And I suppose that the one the one good point was that Overton was back and sort of showed signs, um, you know, with the with the dismissal of uh, of Evan Lewis. Of a, of a bowler who might be very very handy for England as a, as a middle overs plunkett two point um, when he's when he's able to by the looks of it yesterday he had um, he was under orders or you know under under load management because we didn't see him again after his opening spell but that he he was a plus in in two factors really because I, I spoke to Rob Key during the uh, the first um, Antigua game. And the reason they played him, knowing that he wasn't going to bowl, because they wanted to see if he had the, you know, the skill to be a sort of like number eight fast bowling all rounder who who gives it a proper bash. Uh, and, and he delivered that um, yesterday and showed signs with the ball that there is there is definitely something there should he be fit. So that that was a plus. Um, there weren't too many others. Mm, yeah, yeah, it's weird that open thing, isn't it? It's kind of it does make sense in the weird logic of this kind of tour where. You want to give him a go uh, because you know there's a guy you want to play, but you can't bowl. But also, you've picked a weird squad, so you've got like a million bowling options anyway. I mean, it's, it, it makes it it makes it incredibly difficult to kind of to 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 make any sort of judgment on the trip. And I think you know from the outset, I think England would it, it was as a much a fact finding mission as as anything um, about sort of you know the younger players, how much depth you you potentially got. In terms of a, in terms of squad building, where the future might look in in you know, three four years time, maybe less. Um, but but you walk a real tightrope, particularly with the fans, I think. And I think this is what what is starting to bug people is that yes, um, you know people will understand that you've you've got sort of issues in terms of squads being in different places and tours overlapping and all the rest of it. But at some point, you know, the, the fans are kind of like turning up. They're, they're spending their money and they're seeing seeing England teams that are not what you would call anywhere near sort of full strength and you're losing. Um, and people are starting to get a little bit grumpy about that, I think. So it's as much as as much as I think there are a lot of positives out of it, mostly Bethel, Overton. You know, there were, there were players who have suddenly got a bit of international experience who would not necessarily have got it. They didn't look out of place. Livingston's elevation to captain and, and batting higher up the order, and, and you know he's starting to deliver. Well, he, he's been delivering on the on the promise for a little while now, or at least looking like he's sort of cracking it. Um, and then that he plays that incredible innings in in match number two. Sam Curran, as 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 we've always or as I've always felt, you know he's much more effective as a as an actual batter rather than somebody who comes in at seven or eight. Um, and so he showed that he has the the skill and probably. Most importantly, the temperament um, in ODI cricket to kind of to to get the tempo, to get the length of the game, and to be able to sort of come in and play spin really well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you can then look at it and go, well, England at full strength, how does he get? How does he get in the team? It's a conundrum, and one that needs to start being sorted out pretty quickly because obviously the, the Champions Trophy is just around the corner. Yeah, I wondered with Curran, if you are looking for a way to get him into the team, are you looking at workloads overall and that kind of thing? Is there an argument to, like, maybe it's just too early to, to put him in this kind of category, but, like, there's this, always this question of a Ben Stokes, isn't there? And, like, is he going to, you know, is he retired? Is he not? If he's in the side, is he bowling? And then, actually, you also, you kind of look at Ben Stokes' bowling record, and it's kind of more relevant that he can bowl than how good his bowling is in 50 over cricket. Like, in 50 over cricket, he averages, what, 42 with the ball, goes over run a ball, like... If, if you need someone who's there just kind of like as a pressure alleviator in your top six to make sure you've got a balanced side and you think that current strength is actually going to be as a guy in the top four or five and you don't get the best out of him in number seven, is is, is that possible or is that kind of crazy 
at this point, given what Curran's done as a bachelor's career so far? Well, I mean, yeah. It, it, so, so Ben Stokes' usefulness or his his great role as in 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 England ODI teams has always been as the sort of you know, as the the cold hearted finisher, um, you know, the, the batter at six, really difficult position to to bat in in ODIs, I think. Um, and the bowling is always just a, a sort of an add-on, an extra as a as an extra bowler or a, a safety valve bowler. He's tentatively put his hat back in the ring, hasn't he, um, to to play in ODIs again? Um, and and if that's the case, um, it, it's a it's quite a compelling or a beguiling thought that that he would that he would automatically step back into that role. But you, you'd certainly think that Sam Curran has the you know going forward has the the ability. To bat higher than than the positions that he's that he's traditionally been offered in ODI cricket, and that his bowling becomes less and less of a factor, um, you know, and so almost surface dependent. You know, if you've got something that's a little bit grippy or um, whatever, or if for some reason that you know new ball bowlers have, have got injured and, and you've got him there and he can bowl in the in the power play when the ball's potentially swinging. But given a, a full strength squad with a with a relatively balanced team, you kind of think, well, how how does he slot into that? Despite the mm. fact that he is very, very good, you know, he's a, he's an excellent, excellent player, but because of where his strengths are, they get overridden by other people's sort of, you know, better bowling skill, perhaps, or or more, um, more traditional kind of top five, top six batting skill. Um, so it's a, it's a conundrum because he's a, you know, he's a bloody good cricketer, terrific competitor, and all the rest of it, but he might just find himself on the outside of England's best eleven, and especially now that Livingston. I mean, he just has to be at six or maybe five. And, and that, that, like, that was just such a good innings in that second ODI. And, and, and I do find it weird because obviously for most cricketers, like the really hard thing would be hitting, you know, 74 off 28 at the end or whatever. And yet with Livingston, we're saying like, oh, isn't it amazing that he was 49 or 58? And it's just it's so funny how it flips like that. But, but that is the thing that is kind of, the more encouraging thing in a way. I mean, yeah, that's and that's perhaps the thing that's been that's been missing from his game. You know, it, although you know, record-wise, he's actually in ODI cricket in particular, he's actually his that record is actually pretty good. Um, I think it, it, it things get coloured a little bit by his by his um, by his T20 numbers, which which are, are, are less than uh, well for, for somebody who's such a such a great ball striker and so destructive, are, are kind of less than impressive almost. But again, it sort of proved that most of these guys, the guys who have the reputation for, for huge hitting, actually, just like anybody else, prefer to have a little bit more time to get themselves in and get settled before they can cause real damage. Um, so let's touch on some of the other batters. I guess Salt, we obviously mentioned a bit, but that, that is encouraging that he did that. And he also, even in the second ODI, you know, he rarely gets past the power play. And this time he did. I think, I think these were the first two times since his debut series that he's faced more than 30 balls in an ODI innings against a full member team. I mean, it was that was his longest ODI innings yesterday when he got past 90, 90 95 or something like that. I mean, I, I, I really like him because I think beyond the obvious, you know, the eye-catching, ball striking, et cetera, hand-eye coordination, um, he just he just strikes me as somebody that is just desperate to kind of work hard and become the absolute best he can be. And he, he showed defensively yesterday that he had a, that he had a game you know, to be able to play in, in, in more than one way. And that's, I think that's, that's hugely encouraging. So, you know, he, he's a massive, massive tick. Um, obviously, Will Jacks had a, had a lean time of it and kind of in the same way that Salt sort of has dispelled the myth that he's very one dimensional, sort of Jacks rather reinforced it that perhaps at the moment he is. Then you've got Cox at number three, who, you know, very, very talented boy. But you know, worryingly, kind of got got done for pace by Shamar Joseph in Antigua with that with the short ball, and then, you know, I mean, it's a hell of a delivery from a very angry Alzari Joseph. <laughs> but then, you know, to get out back to back games to the short ball is is never a, is never a nice thing, um, and never something that that doesn't sort of raise a few eyebrows in terms of, you know, your ability at that at that elevated level. Um, but you know, too early to to write him off as yet. But then, and then you go to the to the we've already spoken about Livingston and Curran, but then you go to the two youngsters from Warwickshire. You know, Bethel looked looked fabulous in that second game and has got enormous enormous talent and potential. Um, so he was a as I said a massive tick. As was uh, was Dan Mosley at the end there. I thought that was a really fine innings because again he had to he had to come in and still negotiate sort of work England towards um, you know the fortieth over 
making sure that they still had five wickets in hand when they got to that point. Um, and he showed some, you know, some some wonderful ball striking and, and you know, de- really decent play against spin. And so, yeah, it's a, a huge plus for England that those young guys, those debutants, um, had sort of shown that they were not out of place at, at, uh, at the top level. And I guess final thing, like, there's been quite like some talk about the sort of like, you know, root causes for, for this kind of series. We obviously part of it is, you know, the schedule seeing them having to pick a weird squad, but people, you know, come back again to the fact that these guys haven't played much list day cricket. Even Salt, who actually has played a bit compared to the other guys, he um he was saying before, I think between the second and third game, that it would be nice if, you know, they were able to get back into rhythm between these series, that kind of thing, rather than this happening. But then also I wonder like, you know, does playing some Metro Bank games in April prepare Jordan Cox for facing Shamar Joseph, Alzari Joseph? I don't know. Can that be overblown, or do you think it is? It is, it is a factor. Well, I mean, it's less. It's less about the. It's less. It's less about the opposition, perhaps, or whatever, and more about sort of what all of these guys talk about, sort of trying to find the, the, the right sort of tempo or the or the right feel for making runs consistently and at the right sort of rate in in 50 over cricket because simply they've had no experience of having to do it um you know Salty had played 24 ODIs before this before this tour started J- Jacks had played 12 Cox had played four list A games in total in his entire career Livingston with, with 30 caps was was third in the list um with with Rashid way out ahead Curran with 32 was second and then you go down to, you know, but Mo- Mosley hadn't played a list day game since 2021. <laughs> Rahan Ahmed had played six. Turner's played 17. Saki Mahmood um, has played eight, eight ODIs. I mean, it's just, there is just so little knowledge there in terms of the, in terms of the 50 over format. So, you know, what, when, when England would get the chance to play them, what, you know, if they, even if they were able to play them, what, uh, the fact that the 100 then overrides that and means that they are not going to be playing any 50 over cricket gives you very little scope for kind of building some sort of confidence um, in your ability to kind of to, to work out that really difficult skill of balancing sort of aggression and run accumulation. Um, you know, with, with then giving your undoubted ball striking ability the chance to sort of have its, have its most um, effective uh, place in the in the, in the format. So you know, there's very little blame that can be attached to to the players because they they literally have no idea what they're doing on <laughs> for the most part. And that you know, and this is something that was was flagged at the time. Something that is just that shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody. Um, that if you decide a format is pretty much surplus to requirements, um, at some point you're going to have a team that has got no experience of doing it, and then you're unlikely to go out there and pull up any trees at it because uh, because everybody else in the world still still plays it as a as a matter of course. Mm, yeah, well, bring on the Champions Trophy. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, the cha- Champions Trophy wise, at least, you know, you go you go to England's more senior looking lineup, at least these guys sort of grew up playing it at some point. They might not have played it for some while, but at least there is a little bit in there in their DNA um and, and muscle memory that they that they remember and know how to do it and have played you know, not many of them have played have played hundreds of, of 50 over games at international level but at least there is a, a body of work behind them that gives them half a chance of knowing what's going on um but there, but it won't be very long before there is none of that yeah. um, probably by 2027 and, and, and then even then you have like you know guys like joe Root, presume he comes back in he looks so short of match practice at the world cup because He's not playing ODIs, and then the guys that are playing ODIs, the guys who haven't played List A cricket. But again, you know, who's who's shocked? No one. On, on that cheery note, Butch, <laughs> I'll bid you farewell, and uh, uh, yeah, h- h- hope for a bit more, a bit more lightheartedness after the T20 eyes. Yes, a bit of levity would be good, wouldn't it? Phil. Mm. Uh, have your opinions on Liam Livingston changed at all in the last week or months? He certainly had a good couple of months uh, in both forms. Um, the hundred could end up being a, you know, landmark moment in his career. It could be the hinge point in his career where he got it done, finally got it done, was there at the end, took responsibility, played, measured, and then did what he does more characteristically. Uh, it, it's it's always appeared to me, for what it's worth, that you know the the ball striking is outstanding, 
The physical components of his game are great. He's a he's a very good fielder. He's a very useful bowler within the within the context of a strongish attack. You wouldn't want him to kind of be your, your central spinner, but as an adornment, he's really good. Um, but will he ever crack it? Will he ever crack the like the, the alchemy, the rhythms of of, of top level batting? That was always the question for me. And um, he he has said himself that he was stuck. Uh, and pigeonholed in that last bracket, that that kind of the, just the death overs slogger, the death overs hitter, and that becomes quite restrictive. And in fairness, he has been given more responsibility the back end of the summer and now through this. Uh, and he's 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 loaded up the numbers for sure. And he's not a cricketer with the bat that I ever particularly lean to, warm to, or lean towards. And perhaps I've uncharitably in the past kind of used him as the if you like this, the, the figurehead of the shift in priorities and changes and texture of the game, um, because he's a kind of he's a useful shorthand for 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 where the English game is is heading and what and what the English game has become. But that's that's probably to to unfairly denigrate uh, the fellow's talent, and he is now becoming whisper it. And it's still early days, it's still embryonic, but whisper it, he's becoming one of England's key men. And it was interesting that they threw in the captaincy and that it's not held him back, but if anything, you know, grown him up, grown him out a little bit. And, and now he looks like he has a bit more assurance. There was always a sort of scatterish, sort of you know, cha- chaotic approach that he brought to his England appearances. And, and thus it felt like he was just stuck for years almost in this kind of like death cycle of just, you know, trying to smash it up in the air and clear three men on the mid-wicket boundary and, Holding out second or third shot, and and so it's 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 a good it's a good move by England to say basically now or never. He wasn't even in the the ODI mm. squad, right? Is that right? Yeah, the one against Australia. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and so that they've clearly thought right in this transitional moment we need something. We need we need to hang our hat on a couple of key players, and take a punt. It's a massively transitional time. They keep losing cricket matches. Mm. The, the Morgan era drifts further and further away off the horizon line. Uh, but with him, there are, there are signs that at 31, he might just be cracking this thing. Yeah. And I do wonder, like, this does just happen sometimes, right? Like you have guys who yeah. cl- clearly have the talent and it is around this sort of age they do. You know, you look at like, okay, Travis Head is a year younger and has been in that sort of form a bit longer than Livingston has. But still, he would have been like, you know, a guy who you would look at and think like, oh, he's got all this talent, but he's not quite putting it together. And then they just do around the age, you know, late 20s, early 30s. And I do sometimes wonder if England think of guys, because because they're so determined on picking guys who are going to be in the side for the next 10 years. And actually, if there are some guys who sort of would have cracked it, had they been given an opportunity at that time when they kind of have worked out their game and are ready to take that step up. and But, but they've almost played so much cricket by that point that, you're like, well, we know everything we need to know there is about them. And actually, sometimes they can uh, they, they can sort of surprise you, I think, even at that age. Yeah, possibly. Possibly. It had to happen for him quickly. Mm, for sure. Yeah, it was now or never, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, how do you see it, Daniel? The England scene seems like it's in, in a state of wild flux, right? The white ball side. What's your impression looking on? Yeah, I mean, just on Livingston, I, I've, I've always thought he was a really good player. And I, I thought that he was just unlucky that he coincided with such a great white ball side in England. I mean, I think he'd walk into most teams. South Africa would have him in a heartbeat. He said, bats, bowls, clears the boundary. Looks like he's got a bit of leadership about him. So I I'm a, I don't know him personally, but you know, you kind of get an affinity. For, you know, you, uh, you, you like cricketers from abroad and I, I'm, I'm glad to see him going well. I mean, I'm actually, I, I kind of want to throw it back to you guys. I mean, like, it just seems like it's just nonstop, right? I mean, how, how does any England cricket fan, cricket journalist, cricket player get a foothold on on what is this non-stop circus like how, how do you you know so we're going to talk about south africa's world test championship and we started at the top about the heartache you know there's sort of these like flashpoints right you can kind of build up to it experience it decompress and then kind of give yourself a bit of a breather if you if you're an england cricket follower how do you just not get overwhelmed by the sense of ennui even when it comes to big tournaments i mean like well, well, well the, the, the answer to from my point of view is that you don't overcome it <laughs> <laughs> right. It's just woven in now. It's just a, it's just an acceptance that it's too much. You 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 like geese getting stuffed with the thing that you love. Well, 
you know, for me, it's there are two very different games at play. Literally, there, there's there's a game where eleven players go out and they play across five days, and there's a game which serves a very different function. And the secondary game um, is there to sure generate a bit of chat, but it's there to tick certain boxes of required finance for individual uh, venues. It's there uh, to have a look at certain players, but fundamentally it's there to pass the time. It's there to, to fulfill that slot. And sure, there's a lot of slots that are fulfilled, arguably too many, and players are constantly pushing back against that. And I totally understand that position. Um, but they are games of entertainment. They are almost by definition fleeting things. But does that not then mean that the product will ne can't ever be as good? Because for Morgan, yes, there were fleeting, exciting games, but they're also there to win. Under Peterson, you know, when, when, when England won the T20 World Cup with Peter, I don't know if he was captain, but when they won the T20 World Cup, it, it meant something. I mean, is, it, is, that, is that aren't we not being passed on to the players? I, I, think, I think when we, we come to these showdowns, these sort of jamborees, I think it's a different story. Okay. But I think these bits in the middle, right. they are necessary, but only up to a point. Um, and do they leave their mark? No. They don't on me, and I'm not alone there. In fact, I'm in the I'm in the majority. Yeah. That said, even within um, a sense of a, of a kind of a transactional box ticking week somewhere or other, you still do get these little stories that you can you can take from it, and it's sometimes forgotten about, I suppose. But there are players, individual players, even in the even in the the wider context of something that doesn't feel especially substantial. You are still having these individuals who are playing for their careers. Um, and their country. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And someone like Liam Livingston, there, there can be a tendency, certainly where I'm sitting, to be slightly snide or a bit dismissive because I guess I'm amplifying my own concerns, <laughs> my own position with the, within the wider game anyway. Uh, but if, you, if I can step back from it, as I should, then that 120-odd not out, under immense pressure as captain when England were staring down the barrel of a 2-0 and would have ended up being a 3-0, you know, that could be a life-changing innings. And so even within it, you also have on the other end of the scale, Jordan Cox, who can't buy a run, just trying to get himself going. He'll be feeling very conscious of that. So even within it, there are still these, these, these threads that you can still pull out. But does, does it stay with me? And crucially, do I hurt if England lose? I mean, even those words coming out of my mouth sound a bit weird, you know. But, but with a test match... You know, don't get me wrong, I don't wake up in the morning feeling grumpy, but I do wake up in the morning and it's the first thing I think if, you know, if, if the game has gone one way or the other night, the night before, and it does feel like it, it has some, some weight to us all, you know. And, and, and an ODI randomly slotted in somewhere can never have that kind of heft. Yeah, I, I, I do feel like... How do you see it, by the way? Sorry. Cricket or, no, no, or for, English for, cricket? If, if you like, from... From a South African, I know, you know, you're an Anglo-South Anglo African writer, but from as a South African follower, does is there still that dividing line in your cricket or is it more of a homogenous thing? It's because it feels like the game is sort of on life support and, you know, we're constantly told that it, it's one bad year away from collapsing into the, into, you know, a pit of darkness it does in my mind personally as a cricket tragic who kind of you know define the rhythms of my life by test series and, and and white ball tournaments i am more invested on an emotional sense professionally there's sort of less demand for south african cricket so i've you know I, i'm writing a lot more on rugby these days than, than i than i did when i first moved to this country but i feel like it does matter because i feel like there's something at stake for south african cricket and if they keep losing if if they aren't players who can make big tons when Kakis Robata retires and there isn't like a a, a, a convey about a fast bowling ton if that ever dries up. The thing I love so much and the thing I've loved probably longest in my life could disappear. And so for me it matters, but I don't and, and what about for you know, peers back at home? Yeah, well what well, again, the cricket tragics will feel the same way, but I And what about your cricket? curious you're yeah, agnostic th that's that's the thing and that's why that's why it matters to me because they are only going to get behind a team that wins and if the team's rubbish they'll they'll vote with their feet and we, we've seen i mean the last time england were in town for a test match and wood and someone else was abroad was spanking our medium pace mm. bowlers all around the wanderers 
there was no one there and, mm. and that that really felt like a low point and i thought if they don't get the act together and we'll talk about the sa20 and how that's revived things and, and even had a consequence on the proteus but I, that that feeling has, has really stuck with me i mean even though it's years later what was that 2020 it, it it's almost like the warning sign of how things could go if the team doesn't get its act together. Okay. So, so its popularity is predicated on success. C- certainly, I think I think in a sport like rugby, which is so tethered to the nation, in a sport like football that has the mass appeal of the majority of the population, they will kind of always be okay financially. But I think cricket does need a winning team to stay relevant. And yet, looking at it, sorry Ben, looking at it from a distance without anywhere near the knowledge that you have of of the structure of South African cricket, it seems that even though you hear about these kind of, you know, obituaries, you know, preparing, sharpening their pens and so on. Even though, but to the eye, it looks like there, there remains that conveyor belt, right? And that conveyor belt remains actually quite alive and quite flourishing, yeah. even though you're also reading these, these disaster stories as well. Because the school system is, is still productive, because the club game is still um, productive. And, you know, if, if, I hope this doesn't veer into jingoism, the weather, our natural athleticism. Sure, you know, sure. As long as as long as someone's delivering a ball and someone else is trying to whack it into orbit, they'll yeah. be a South Africa. Yeah. Now they could be playing for New Zealand or England or for the various <laughs> franchises. They might not be playing for South Africa. Yeah. But there'll always be South African cricketers. Right. Just are the I mean, as we saw with the New Zealand series that where they sent their D team, will the best be representing the country? That's that's the worry. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I think we'll be getting more into this kind of thing structure the with the world game in in part two we, we can talk a bit more about about test cricket in a way because um england have announced a test squad to tour new zealand uh probably three main talking points phil let's start with the most eye-catching name in there jacob bethel yet to make a professional hundred england's backup batter on a test tour which make of that uh a gamble audacious totally consistent with how they do things well you know what it sort of is consistent but actually I think it's a, a bit of a departure because if you look at their kind of their, you know, their selections based on, uh, you know, release height or attributes in the past, they have been selecting for a type of player that they don't get in other ways. So, so they've, they've gone with spinners because the county game doesn't nurture them in that way. And they've gone with fast bowlers. Actually, if you look at the batters they've picked until now, they've got a bit funky. Like, you know, they've put Duck up to open. They've given Jamie Smith the gloves and he doesn't keep for his county. But they have until now basically just picked guys from pretty much the top five or ten of the county championship run scorers chart i think this is the first time they've done that for for test cricket but it is still obviously it's still more it's less surprising that this england team have done it than the previous ones have done it. yeah okay i just it, it's consistent with their attitude towards the cold hard currencies of runs and wickets mm-hmm. yeah and experience built up over years and the bodies of work uh so it's consistent with their sort of flagrant disregard for all that stuff the stuff that used to matter um, do I have an issue with it? No, not really. But in part because if you're looking for a number five, six reserve, then there aren't that many who are screamingly obvious to be picked. Um, Dan Lawrence has been the kind of nominal support batter, but that has yet to convince them or, or me. Uh, and... While there are some very good candidates who have scored good runs across a period of time, there's no one that you're that you're looking at and saying, "How the hell is that person not 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 getting a getting a look in?" You know, Sam Hayne, for example, is a very very talented player, um, but you know his numbers are not irrefutable. There are others that you can pick out within the middle order of English cricket, if you like, who give them a, a murmur of, of class. But there's nothing to me that is absolutely glaring. Jordan Cox would be the next one there, but Jordan Cox is already going. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I don't mind it at all. I think he sets up quite technically sound. I think he's quite orthodox. Uh, his People will assume that he's a white ball cricketer who whacks it. He's, he does it from a very, very classy and solid, conventional, orthodox kind of base. Uh, and he's left-handed as well, and they don't have many. That's another thing. Can't underestimate that, really. If you take Stokes out of that middle order and you take Duckett out, you've got, you got a team of right-handers from top to bottom. So so he's he's a useful counterpoint to that. He's a very good fielder. He's a useful little left-arm spinner as well, potentially down the line. And, you know, they want to look at him. There is... all I would All I would say is that it feels especially with Cox's struggles initially, it does feel 
flimsy going into what should be a really big deal tour for England. So New Zealand have demonstrated what is possible. Uh, and in a way, they've highlighted what England's tour of India last year really was, which was a huge missed opportunity. And England always turn up to New Zealand with a bit of, a, you know, looking to get a bit of sun and, and you know, golf, yeah, yeah and, and enjoy it, enjoy it the most beautiful country in the world and all of that. And they always just, they'll, they'll shake hands on a one-one and then everyone will crack on and go home. But now this series feels different. And it feels like they're going up against a team that could well be in the WTC final. We'll come to that later on. And a team that is demonstrating how to really do it. New Zealand are overachieving almost routinely. And England, for all their joys, for all their compelling, they have underachieved with the results. They've lost three and four. They should never have lost three in the last four. When you consider who they are and, and how they play and the talent they've got. So this becomes a really big tour. Um, and you are running into it with Jordan Cox, almost certainly keeping wicket, right? Yeah, Ollie Pope would be the only option. Or Ollie Pope. Either way, that's, that's slightly wild and it will almost certainly be Cox. Yeah. And if Joe Root breaks a finger, then Jacob Beffel's in at four, in at four or five. <laughs> Suddenly that looks like a team that is almost insultingly experimental do you know what i mean yeah no for sure yeah and i guess looking at guys i think ollie robinson is one of the names he leaps out durham's ollie robinson he's probably paying the price for a poor end to the season he started it really well and then faded away a bit i think if he'd got 100 or two in the last few rounds of the county championship maybe he would have snuck in there as a week even back up and batting back up um i wonder as well dan and there's a south african relevance here do you think there can be a temptation like someone like jacob bethel is if he weren't doing this, he's probably going to get, you know, what a big bash gig or whatever other T20 league's going to go up and then he gets another the start of next year and then he's not going on England Day Tour because he's playing these T20 stuff and then the start of next summer he's in the PSL rather than playing the county championship. Um, and I look at Tristan Stubbs, who um, it kind of feels like he's, you know, he's made his maiden 100 last week, but in a way you're almost picking him before he's ready because you want to just get him into the side before he, get, before he gets kind of just sucked into the conveyor belt of franchise cricket. Obviously, he's still played a fair bit of it, but like before he's in that bit, do you, do you think that like that is a thing that kind of happens now? You almost have to get the guys you think are really talented in earlier than you otherwise would because otherwise you kind of you run the risk of sort of losing them altogether. Well, I think you do if you're South Africa, but I'm surprised that England would feel their way. I mean, I, I wouldn't think that England have selected this guy because they they worry that he wouldn't you know, that he'd be lost to a franchise system. I mean, maybe maybe that is the case. But you talk about Stubbs. I mean, I remember when Stubbs walked out to bat at three in the World Cup final against India, mm -hmm. he just, I was, you know, I thought, okay, well, there's the game. He, he's not a three. He's 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 too inexperienced. But he just looked like the man of born. He, he, he was so composed. And seeing him make 100, his first test ton, admittedly not against the great attack. I mean, everyone's celebrating this is the first... Uh, series win in Asia for a long time, but Bangladesh were pretty rubbish. But be that as it may, he still's got to make the runs. He he looks, I don't know. He he looks elite level ready. I I don't know. Maybe, maybe Bethel is, maybe he isn't. I I, I watched. Uh, I, I did a couple of the games um, when he made his his white ball debut. He still looks like a young player, if you know what I mean. The way he kind of carries himself. Maybe I'm being harsh on him, but no, you, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, he's not made a a, a hundred in in senior cricket. Yeah, yeah. So he 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 doesn't. He doesn't look like you say if Root breaks a finger, if he's the next guy. I mean, I'm I'm kind of staggered that that is the it case. Is, it so, is amazing when, as well, when you think that England English cricketers play 14 games a year. Yeah, with the county championship. Year. Uh, it's the home of Red Bull cricket, all the rest of it. Yeah. You, if nothing else, you get miles under your belt, right? Yeah. And so they had they had to pick Stubbs, South Africa, because there frankly was no one else. How, how can there be no one else besides Bethel? Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah. again, I don't want to I don't want to be mean to this young lad. I'm I'm chuffed for him. I hope he goes and has a great career. But is that alarm bells for English cricket? I th I think it's 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 just the creed now. It's their it's their philosophy, and and it's perhaps become almost ostentatiously so. You know, you would think that. The MD of English men's cricket in Rob Key, who's an estimable bloke, would couch his language a bit, but he doesn't. He leans into it. And they want to say, they want to make it clear that they have their own way of identifying talent. Um, and they will argue that it runs further back than simply what's what, you, what you're seeing in professional cricket. They would argue that Jacob Bethel was England under-19s opening bat, made runs in the under-19s World Cup, and that they've known about his 
brilliant since he was since he turned up in England from Barbados as a teenager. And so they will be saying quite openly, well, it might take a year or two, but but, but we know that he's he's our answer. Uh, you, you don't have to speak to, to too many county coaches and county players to know that there is a fair amount of disgruntlement within the game itself uh, because there's a lot of players who are trying their balls off, you know, week after week, year after year, and they feel like they're, they're just being disregarded and their numbers are being almost thrown back in their face. And there's a lot, of, a lot of people who have complained about this. But like you said, if no one's got irrefutable numbers, like, isn't that their, you know, if, 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 they, if they're making it that Bethel, we can even have an argument about, well, does Bethel make cricket sense or is it a pun for the future? If we can ev- even having that conversation, isn't, doesn't some of the, you know, don't some of the, the guys who are more traditional, don't they need to shoulder some of the responsibility for not putting up irrefutable numbers, as you said? Yeah, up to a point. Yeah. Um, I, I think... I think it's also the nature of English cricket as well. You know, there's no player out there that is a, is a sure bet. You know, you can have a player can be brilliant for two years and you think, right, there you go. And then can go missing for a year and average your know, single figures. Hasipa Mead was the, the golden boy and then averaged 9.4 across a whole year. The one player who, who would be in my squad for what it's worth is Keaton Jennings because uh, he is... He'd be an excellent reserve opener and an excellent reserve number three as well. And I think he's technically sound. He's playing really, really good cricket. He's emerged from that tough time with a refined technique. There's a lot more flow to his game. He makes runs year after year. He's also popular. He's a part of that setup. Um, but perhaps he just kind of literally doesn't quite quite hit the same, you know, as 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 this cool looking blue eyed you know, Gen Z type kid who's coming out there and... Caribbean accent. Exactly, yeah. Peroxide hair yeah. Uh, and all the rest of it. Um, but no, I'd have... Personally, I'd have had Jennings in the, in the side uh, for a bit more sort of pragmatism up top. If they do lose an opener... Jennings then, 3, Route 4, Pope 5 suddenly looks like a really good right, order. Right, in, indeed, indeed. But we were talking about this the other day and they don't like moving people around. You know, Pope struggled a bit at three. Certainly Feast and Famine at three. And I wondered if perhaps in the fullness of time, he might be a better five... He'd never batted three before he was called into the side he is a as a number three. Yeah. yeah, and the way that he plays, the like the freneticism, the skittishness, the energy that he brings, he looks like a natural five, doesn't he? Mm, I think so. You know, runs hard between the wickets, looks to get going, but would you hang your hat on him to, to make runs at, on the final day of your life from number three? Well, he's not Ricky Ponting, but yeah. then, all right, no, many aren't, but you know what I mean. Yeah. So yeah, to me, a more sensible option would have been to have brought in someone who's played Test cricket before, bat him in the top three, even open him and bat Crawley at three potentially. But you know th- those two are going well. But yeah, I would have had him in my squad personally. Yeah, um, I guess also Tom Banton injured maybe a bad time. I think that that might have been the kind of the middle ground pick of an exciting young guy who's got a bit of a record behind him. Who yeah, had, that's had a, a good really good season. But- that's a good shout. That hundred and thirty. He made against Surrey before he he balked his ankle yeah. up. Yeah, and and then also the the forty odd in the second innings was was remarkable, yeah. wasn't it? Just standing yeah. there, not moving his feet, but somehow reverse hoiking. No, indeed, Shakib, who you know maybe chucking it. Uh, yeah, I think I think <laughs> I think that was, action. Um, you're not being libelous there, are you? I think that no, there is, no, there no, is it's, something it's, kicking it's, around. It's, there. it's it's out it's out in the public domain. Yeah, that okay, his right. actions reported. Yeah, yeah. and you can, he's, he's also and got, you can go and watch the highlights. Uh, he's, he's got bigger problems to deal with as well, Shakib, than than whether he chucked it at Taunton for a couple of days. Um, so, so you mentioned obviously Jordan Cox set to keep with Joey Smith on paternity leave. England have also picked three spinners. Uh, so Rian Ahmed, Jack Leach and Sher Bashir. I think what's happened there is there was actually a game that, I mean, it also didn't, it, it was helpful-ish for the spinners when South Africa tour there, you know, Neil Brand took six or five on Davy, didn't he? Um, but then also there was a game that New Zealand played against Australia in New Zealand where Lyon took a load of wickets, Glenn Phillips did. So it like you can get the odd pitch that turns. So I think that's why they've gone with Leach and Bashir. And I feel like Rian Ahmed is like, well, you bowled really well in the last game and we really like you, so let's keep you around. So I think that's why it's three spinners, which feels like, you know, sometimes three too many for a tour of New Zealand. But I think that's how they've they've got there, I think. Hmm. Um, I, I was pleased to see Rian in the squad. I didn't think he would be. Glad to see that he is. I like him a lot. I thought it was a huge moment for him in that final test match, Pakistan. Yeah. Final bit of England news. They've announced their next raft of central contracts. Um, Given a fair few of them are just kind of rollovers of multi-year deals from last year. There's not loads to discuss, but I guess it's, if a lot of this podcast is quite like, is it good news for the health of the game or bad news for the health of the game? 
Ben Stokes and Joss Butler signing on for the next two years uh, is good news. I guess, especially in the case of the latter, who, you know, when you see him look, you know, sad and doe-eyed on a on an outfield in the in the Caribbean and having come off the back of the World Cup and then everyone's talking about, you know, is he the right man to captain the side? You wonder if he might just sort of like sail off into the sunset having done his bit for English cricket, but he's now locked in for the next two years. Yeah, I don't think England, England really... I mean, England's requirements are just completely different to almost everywhere else in the world, right? You know, as, as someone with South African blood and leanings, it must be amusing to listen to the, to English punters like us going, well, thank God that Joss has signed on. They, they're going to sign on because, because the money is there. Bottom line, the money is there. Uh, and so England don't struggle to maintain and hold on to their players. It's elsewhere where these, these questions are more hard-edged. It, it is a bit like watching people argue about, you know, the, choosing between the lobster or the caviar yeah, a, a little bit. Right, totally. you know, my, my band totally. is not working anymore. Yeah, yeah. totally. I get that. Yeah. I get that. We sound ridiculous. Mm, yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, good to know. That, yes, that, yeah. They're back on. Just for the record. <laughs> anyway, lobster for the record. Yes, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, that would be a weird choice I have to make, actually. Come on. Uh, that, sorry, that, that'll do for part one. Part two, we will get deep into the World Test Championship. Right, on to the World Test Championship. New Zealand, having already won the series, beat India in Mumbai by 25 runs to consign the host to their first ever home whitewash in a series of three or more matches. It's just one of the most astonishing results in, in Test history, isn't it? I mean, it's staggering. I, I, I generally still can't quite believe it happened. I didn't, I didn't watch the first Test at all because I just assumed mm. New Zealand were going to get hammered. And then I saw they won and I... I kind of explained it away and I thought, okay, well, obviously India must have played the kids and I saw the lineup. Okay, well, obviously they had a bad day. And then I only really started paying attention when in the second test that the India's batters were struggling for the second time in that match. And mm. I thought, hang on, is this actually going to happen? And even when they won the series, I thought, no, well, okay. Again, explain away the conditions. And I, I went back and I read everything and I watched everything. And I, it's, it's absolutely remarkable. I mean, how New Zealand keep doing this? A, a, a team on the edge of the world that where where cricket is to call it to call cricket a second sport in New Zealand is is almost like inflating it beyond what it really is. I mean, it's it's a it's you know fourth in a two horse race kind of thing. You know, rugby is 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 religion there. Um, fair play to him. How can you not? I mean, it's 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 quite dangerous that we you know to sound patronising when talking about New Zealand cricket. But my goodness, fair play to them. What a bunch of champions. Um, I hope they keep the torch alive forever. Yeah, I mean, this game, so, I mean, their hero in the last game is Mitchell Santner. He's ruled out by injury. So, Ajaz Patel, who had kind of been almost worryingly out by Santner in that last game, he takes 11. Uh, he's got this amazing record at the Wankadee. So, he's got 25 wickets in two games there. And only three Indians have more wickets at the Wankadee than him, <laughs> which, is, uh, which is mad. And he's also, he's still yet to take a home test wicket. Um, wow. So, he's got about 85 wickets at an average just under 30 and yet to get one in the, uh, in the lang land of the long white cloud. Yeah, they dropped him straight after the 10, the 10 for in the innings, didn't <laughs> yeah. they? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah that was him, Next right. test match, he was out. Yeah. Um, on this game, I kind of thought India just looked completely shot. I mean, the, the, I think almost... that They actually did end up taking a, a first innings lead, but on that first evening, they lost three wickets. So one is the... Uh, I think uh, Jaiswal misses a sweep. Then the night watchman comes in, Siraj, pin WW first ball, takes a review with him, and then Kohli smashes one to mid on and just sets off straight away and is run out by like by a couple of yards. Um, he just can't catch a break, that kid, can he? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, but it did just kind of feel like, here we go again, in a way that, you know, previously in Indian cricket, like it's, it's the opposition who feel, here we go again, you know, it's like you get them five or six down, it's like, oh no, but wait, here comes your Adrian Ashwin, and they're going to just put on 150 and bail them out of it. Or, you know, okay, they've only, you're, you're only chasing 200, but, you know, here comes Adrian Ashwin, and they're going to bowl you out. Or Richard Pant comes in and, and wax it just when you think you've got a toe hold in the game. Whereas this time it felt like actually every time India were almost in danger of putting the game out of sight, that was when it was like the chase. They were 29 for five and then got 106 for six and then were 121 all out. It's it's not great, is it, Phil? <laughs> uh, well, it is great. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's, it's, great. it's objectively yeah, great. <laughs> yeah. And also I wonder if you talk to proper in India fans for whom the game is right in there, of course, they're going to want their side to win. But there's something rousing for the game, right? You know, it's it's stirring for the game itself. And I wonder if there's actually more Indian fans than you might think who who quietly, secretly think 
this is good, right? No one can, no, surely no one can enjoy being impregnable for a decade and more at home and almost literally never losing a test match or losing one test match a year at most. This is a shot in the arm for the game that must be felt all over the place. It's just, it just so happens that for that to feel really, really strong and vital, India have to be the fall guys. But if you think of, if you look at it in the round, then everyone is fighting for, for this thing to survive. And I've said this many times before, but I believe it. The notion that India as the sort of the centrifugal part, you know, the epicenter of the game is somehow orchestrating its, its, its shift away from Red Bull cricket. Well, it's not really played out by, by the reality because they tour more than any other team in the world, right? They flog their players to within an inch of, of exhaustion um, to serve the, the Red Bull game as much as they serve their own interests elsewhere. Uh, and that needs to be considered. You know, their, their doors are open to all teams. They are faithful to the Future Tours program. They help draw it up. They obviously have the power to reduce it if they want to, and they don't. Jay Shah, their boss, is going to become ICC president. We'll yeah. probably come to that yeah. in a minute. Again, that'll be an interesting move, but people, there might be a kind of flex concern. India have too much power. It, you know, the ICC is a sort of offshoot of the BCCI. We know all of that, but the evidence to me is flimsy that India uh, misused the Red Bull game. Um, and so this this win, this extraordinary turnaround, this heist, and it's a legitimate win, by the way. You know, you can you can fluke a test match on the back of one person being having having a, a day out like they've never had before or since, or a spicy morning first morning, or pitch a wild, a happened, wild yeah. pitch when it's a, it's a crapshoot. But you don't win three naught unless you're the better side, right? So this is this is sending positive shockwaves throughout the game, and I would like to think. Through, through much of Indian cricket as well. Um, just to round it, round up the, the, the strangeness of the last couple of months, and this is, I've just taken it directly from Andy Zaltzman's piece on the BBC, talking about actually Pakistan's turnover against, against England, obviously one down, one, two, one. And he said, look, their brilliance added to what's been a strange and fascinating few months of Test cricket. Uh, England lost to Pakistan, who had lost to Bangladesh, who then lost to India, who have just been thrashed by New Zealand, who had lost to Sri Lanka, who had lost to England. This was written a week and a half ago. It's dated because it doesn't mention that South Africa went to Bangladesh, yeah. who had turned over Pakistan yes. and beat them comfortably 2-0. And right? we'll be hosting Pakistan soon. And you'll be hosting Pakistan soon. You'll probably lose. God knows. You probably, you know. yeah. um, England goes to New Zealand. They might, they, they, might they, they may, may well pull it off. Right? Sure. So again... One of the recurring themes about our game is, well, it's played by three teams. The rest are brassic. The rest don't really want to play, but they're kind of tied to this thing that they're trying to extricate themselves from. And ultimately, we're just going to we're just going to move towards this this ugly, like misshapen big three and the have nots, uh, and that the games themselves will end up just reflecting the imbalance, the the known and accepted imbalance of the game. But all right, recency bias, short term thinking, but. If this is not a stirring moment for the game, for Test Cricket, then I, then I don't know what is because it's demonstrating that the game always finds a way to surprise us yet again. And this this series will be talked about for years, for sure. Uh, but it's only really the it's it's only really the, the the most spectacular of a series of spectacular results. Yeah, and it's yeah it has like I think that that is illustrated in just the World Test Championship table, right? right. You've got f first and fifth. Uh, so Australia in first, South Africa actually currently in fifth, but we'll get to actually their very good chance of the World Championship final. They're separated by 8.33 uh, PCT. So like... Could, could you read the top the top five for us? Yeah, so currently it's Australia first, India still second, Sri Lanka third, New Zealand fourth, South Africa fifth. Uh, but as I say, Australia there on 62.5. And if this percentage thing and... Don't South give Africa the numbers because that just means everyone's... Yeah. I don't yeah, understand yeah. it at all. Uh, so we'll... <laughs> So I, I, and, and sorry, sorry, Ben. Just to, so the final is in June. Yeah. Next year yeah. at Law. Yes. Was the Oval last time round? Yeah. Yeah. Laws this time round. Yeah. Yeah. Laws this time round. And so 
we are getting to the business end of this thing, right? So the next six months will determine who who, who finishes. Yeah, exactly. Two. So so there's um th- those are really the only five teams in it still, and there's five relevant series coming up. So obviously India go to Australia for five tests. South Africa host Sri Lanka and Pakistan for two test series each. Uh, New Zealand host England for three tests, and actually kind of to end the whole thing, you've got Sri Lanka against Australia playing two tests, and that could easily be a shootout for the where is that is that in sri lanka that's in sri lanka yeah so so you know real chance that australia go there needing something in conditions where they have you know historically struggled a bit um so i think it looks like about just above this if forget the 61 p but about about 61 pct percentage points whatever should be enough but for that india need four wins from five so that's four wins in australia from five They, they might be with three wins they can sneak in but still, they might probably need to win that series. So you say on the balance, final. then India are unlikely to make the top. I think top so, top. yeah. Wow. Um, Australia need five from seven or four in a draw. So that even that, and that's to like that's to guarantee it. Maybe with winning three in against India Drawing and then one in Sri Lanka might do it, possibly. Blimey, uh, Sri Lanka, three from four. But again, Sri Lanka, you know, beats Africa 2 last time. Could nick a game there. And they need to beat Australia 2 Could happen. New Zealand to get to there need three from three. But, you know, given they've just wipe the floor with India and England are England could happen and so, so sorry they need three from three so they need to whitewash England and they won't then have another opportunity after that yeah it's it's possible that two nil maybe two one could do it but probably they need three from three yeah and then South Africa what probably just need three from four so against Sri Lanka at home and Pakistan at home so I would actually to be honest now make South Africa favorites to well we know how that reach the right? final yeah well well we know that they, they reach the final and then we know what happens in the sure. final i think yeah, yeah. okay so, so south africa hammered bangladesh this week we mentioned it a bit uh made 100 for three guys um kikisa rabada kesh maharaj doing their thing putting together you know state of the world game state of the south african game just look at the players they put out on the pitch it's pretty exciting isn't it well, the bowling's always been good. Yeah. Um, Marco Janssen, Nandre Berger, and Anrik Nokia didn't play in the series. And they are supremely talented, quick, nasty bowlers. Two of them left armers. Marco Janssen swings it both ways. You know, they'd, they'd, they'd push for a place in most other teams. South Africa's just always had a, a bunch of brilliant uh, seamers. Maharaj, South Africa's best ever spinner. But the batting was always a problem. Well, when I say always, since 2018 has been a problem since that series against Australia. They scored four hundreds in this series. They haven't scored four hundreds in a in a year since twenty eighteen. So, you know that that's been a constant problem. And the fact that Markham didn't make runs, but you got Dzorzi making one hundred and seventy seven. I got the, the the thing up in front of me. Stubbs making one hundred and six. Vian Mulder down at at number six or seven. I remember when he first burst in the scene. I I committed the cardinal sin of a journalist. I said, "Here's the next jar colors, basically," which was <laughs> in retrospect a, a very unfair thing to do. Um, but I was young. Um, Could I just ask you yeah. as well on yeah. on the, the the batting side of South African cricket? Yeah. It's it seems like it's been a problem in recent years, but it's not a problem historically, right? No, no, no. I mean, if you, if you look at that side just of ten years ago, sure, you had you run you'd have, through. You'd them. have Smith opening with Alvira Peterson or Neil McKenzie. You'd have Amla at three, uh, Cullis at four, De Villiers at five, Prince at six, Faf was Faf Duplessis, uh, JP Dumini, um, Quinton de Kock coming through. Uh, Balcha was sort of towards the tail end of his career. Aiden Markham burst in the scene when he was batting alongside Dean Elgar. So yeah, so the, I mean, the, you know, the cricket's always been fine, but this has been a period that has coincided with the decline of Test cricket. You know, these conversations that we've been having, um, COVID, the the rise of of the franchise league. So the struggles of the batting has sort of been seen as emblematic of, of a wider malaise within the Is game. Is that fair? I think, or I is think, it, or is it cyclical? No, no. I think. Well, see, that's a good question. It's both cyclical, 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 but um, <laughs> probably cyclical. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> cyclical. Thank you. Um, but I think it is also a consequence of a, of a weakened domestic team, a yeah. uh, domestic product. You know, the 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 six franchises have been turned into twelve provinces, provincial sides, which has diluted the quality. So. Unless you're playing, say, the Lions or, or Western Province who have Proteas in them, you might go two rounds without facing a, an international bowler. So what does that do for the batters, right? The runs are kind of a fake yeah, representation. Yeah, yeah. Colpack dramatically drained those players who wouldn't have made the test team, but would have, with their now and experience, improved, you know, brought up the youngsters. I mean, you think of a guy like Sean Pollock who 
studied under Malcolm Marshall at, at mm. the Dolphins. You know, mm. what, what sort of education did he have? The, this group of players and the, and the players who have struggled for the last six years or so didn't have that because of the cold pack, because of everyone earning a big bucks on, in the franchises. So, mm. But then Dezorzi comes along three years ago and he makes a big double hundred and everyone's like, oh, okay, maybe he has a talent. And then you got Brevis and Stubbs and a bit of a generation there and think, okay, well, here's something to build on. Bet- betting him as well. Yeah. Bet- betting him. I mean, betting him, who's been a, I haven't even mentioned him. He's been a revelation. He, okay, and I'm going to make a, a, a colors comparison, but it's the first time I've seen a South African top water batter who's kind of big in stature, you know, hit the ball on the up when he's driving through the covers, you know, pull in front of square from short balls. You know, even even you think of like AB and Fuff, they're about, you know, I think I might be taller than them. You know, they're not, they like naturally, athletic but they're not big guys so seeing Benningham bash bowlers off the front foot also it's an interesting route to where he's got to with with Benningham. totally and you know you wouldn't necessarily advise it if you're running no. South African cricket no but you, you have to make do right you, if, if you describe the first class system as having been diluted uh from 16 to 12 and so therefore obviously the, the quality is going to be lightened and, and lessened but he has faced Loads and loads of red ball cricket. It's yes. interesting as a comparison to what we were saying about England earlier. Give me Beddingham over the promise of a Bethel any any day of the week because he churns it out year after year. A thousand runs is a given. Um, I've watched him a lot this year, actually, last summer, and he's he's a brilliant player. He's a player. Uh, South Africa got lucky there. Cause, I mean, how many players have been lost? You think of how many New Zealand have got, how many, how many England have got over the years. South yeah, Africans. but but then also Simon Harmer didn't quite work. But again, that could have worked. Could right? have worked. I, I think it's, it's not advisable. But yeah, you know, I'm it's it's an interesting way back into it. Totally, totally. So, Ben, to answer your question, like. Yeah, that you you take out Ryan Rickleton, who's a talent as well. I'm a big fan of him. I think he's got a future in in, in the game. You put Temba Vuma in the middle order. Maybe put Benningham down at, at at five, or even say Temba, you captain from five, which I think five is probably his better position. Less pressure on being the captain, the the leading Black African batter, also the number four batter, so the leading batter. So maybe so okay, you go at five, you do your business there, and that looks like a not bad team actually. Mm. Really strong bowling attack. Mark and Dzorzi, I'm you know. Till the day I die, I will, I will maintain that Ada Markram is a supremely gifted player and a Same world-class here. talent. Uh, our, our editor, also called Dan, yeah. uh, he's his all-time favorite player. Yeah, he might. He's, he, a, he's like a Stan, he, Markram Stan. He might be mine. We made our test debuts together. Funny enough, right? Uh, right. Uh, I was doing a different job, um, but yeah, I, I I think I think there's there's a team there, and if that team does well, then young kids want to play red ball cricket. Then then the coaches want to invest in it. Then the, then the provinces. Take it seriously, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, could I ask you then? Yeah. WTC, mm. say they get it done. Yeah. They then you say they maybe three from four, mm. probably secures in that that final two. They go at Lords and win. What kind of reverberations would that have? That that was my that was my question. Does that feel like winning a cricket World Cup, basically, or not quite? Do you think? Well, okay, I, I, I'll talk for me and what I think the wider public would... For me... How do you think it might be received? Yeah, okay. Well, first of all, for me, 100%. If South Africa make the final, I, I'm I'm tempted to not even go cover it as a journalist, but just to go every day as a fan and wear a different Protea shirt for all four or five days. You can do that and still be on our podcast, by Okay, way. brilliant. Well, if, if you pay me <laughs> enough. Then. Um, but for the fans, yeah, I think because there's been nothing else, right? So say say... India won it. I mean, even you know, even Australia. Like, does it did it matter as much? They've you know, their trophy cabinets are bursting back home. For South Africa, I think it would mean something. I think like New Zealand, when they won it, it would be couched as as a as a historic moment for the game. Maybe some casual fans who don't love Test cricket who find it a bit weird might think, okay, well that was a fun thing that I'm I'm glad they did it. But I think anyone with even half an interest in the sport who recognizes that there ha- it's been a series of heartbreaks forever. This would be something significant, I think. Mm. Yeah, I think I think it would it would divide it would go across the divide. It's it's weird then that you've got the situation where you know because actually at the start of this cycle you looked at South Africa's engagements and it was you know New Zealand away who they'd never lost series to at that point and then West Indies away Bangladesh away three very winnable series and then at home India South Africa Pakistan uh, only Sri Lanka Pakistan only one of those series only one of those teams Sri Lanka had won a series in South Africa for like that you couldn't really ask for an easier set of fixtures and yet Cricket Africa take the decision to send this extremely weakened team to to New Zealand um, and, and then even you know in the case of Bangladesh tour you know this actually you, you mentioned the players who, who missed out who were kind of rested for it 
what, what, what what's going on there? Like, like give us the, the context. Is it, is, it, is it fair to say that South Af- cricket South Africa just aren't that bothered or is or are these things kind of just necessary decisions that they have to make and that tells us where the test game is kind of thing yeah well you answered the question there with with that with that final little caveat because when, when you gave me the show notes my knee jerk was to kind of like come on the defense and be like well of course South Africa cares about test cricket but you know Phil was talking about evidence they sent the D team to go play New Zealand and got rightly spanked Bettingham was kind of the only player that really belonged there um so well they don't Graham Smith says that test cricket's the most important thing, but then he comes with the SA20, uh, which is effectively a, a foreign league hosted in South Africa, um, which is to the detriment of of the sh- at least the short-term health of, of test cricket in the country, Red Bull cricket in the country. Is it fair to say, though, that that may have been one of these really unfortunate yes. anomalies? Yes. And if it were to happen again at any point in the next th- two, three, five years, then sure, you go in... F- both studs up, right? But the way that it that it was explained away had had a, a whiff of sincerity to it to me. I, I th- no, I think it. I think it had. Th- there was sincerity, but I still think it's New a- Zealand wouldn't shift, right? Yeah, they wouldn't it, shift their understandably. They wouldn't shift their 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 schedules. It still felt like a a howler that could have been avoided with proper planning. And given South okay. African cricket, South Africa's history of dropping clangers, quite frankly. It, it felt like a bit of a weak excuse, even though it had cur- you know more than a kernel of truth in it. And, and I was sympathetic to I mean, I'm- Do you think a balance would have been- so, Somehow, to, to, to somehow say, okay, let's send, the, the, let's send the, the test team over for the second test. Because actually the, the second test in New Zealand didn't coincide with the, right. with the SA20. Right. But then, you know, some of those players were playing in the, in the playoffs, and, you know, the final of the SA20. Yeah. So- I am sympathetic, and I and but I some am, of them weren't like 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 Rabada like some of them weren't. Bavuma, I think, played like two games in the SA20, but that, well, that no, Bavu- Bavuma wasn't signed for the SA20. Oh, okay, so yeah, but, but he still didn't, but he still didn't go, did he? So because yeah, I think well, he was a replacement player. In the yeah, end, he was a replacement yeah. player. Yeah. That's right. So I think you know, I I, I when the SA20 came along and, and news broke that the D team was going to go to New Zealand, I, I said that it was a fast impact. I, I said it was necessary. Um, the short term benefits, you know. The, the short, short-term losses would, would yield long-term benefits for, for cricket in South Africa. But I want, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be hard on them in, in January when it happens because we were promised that there was going to be a trickle-down economics, that the money brought by the Indian franchise and, and their owners was going to see grassroots development hubs in rural areas, etc. So I'm, I'm kind of like, I've got this weird relationship with SA20 where I, I want to see some, some fruit. But getting to the point about... Uh, the test side, they got hell of a lucky, didn't they? I mean, the fact that you, you saw the schedule. When they lost to New Zealand, I thought they've blown their chance here. Mm. Um, but yeah, they, they got lucky. Thank you, India. Thank you, New Zealand. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess g- given that, I mean, g- given how good this World Championship has been kind of but on its own merits, like compared to, you know, the previous two, which which have been good, good at times, but this has been like a standout edition. Is it is it doing its job? How would we improve it? Do we get the sense that this thing well, the is WTC? Yeah, is, is, is it maintaining the interest, or is it just something that like we care about and has like a nice file at the end of it? I, I think you are literally the world's expert on the permutations <laughs> of the WTC, mm-hmm. and it appeals to your particularly unique way of looking at the world. Sure, yeah, I lo- love the, making a spreadsheet. Yeah, the, it, you know, I didn't know what the what the league was, uh, and I do this job for a living, ridiculously. Uh, that said, is it an irrelevance to the players themselves? I don't think it is. And I've interviewed a lot of players now about this. And I've, Travis Head interview always comes to mind. Did him after the World Cup. Obviously, he smashed that 100. And he just wanted to talk about his 100 at the Oval. In the, in the, and so I asked him, can you compare the two? He said, no, to me, they, they, they go together. They're both equally important. And Patrick Cummins to our magazine said something very similar just after the Ashes as well, that uh, that, that win is as important as anything that he's done in his career. Uh, In England, I wonder, Mm. yet, because we, you know, we denigrate, sorry, we sort of amplify test cricket to such an extent anyway that perhaps we already feel like it's the most important thing in the world. I don't know. Uh, Maybe it's just because England don't ever get close to to making it and it needs its final in order to convince people. It's obviously a higgledy-piggledy way of doing things, but you can't square that that circle there's nothing you can do about it you you can't you can't encourage brassic 
teams to play the same number of test matches that England are going to play. Yeah. It's just not, not it's unrealistic. I don't know if the, the maths of it um, could be better. That would be an area for you. And I think the proportion of points that are uh, taken from you for over rates is madly disproportionate. So you can win a series and almost be be in the in the red anyway if you if you don't bowl your overs fast enough. To me, that's wild. I'm not saying there shouldn't be any penalties, but the penalties are so extreme, um, and it, it, to me that that that's very unbalanced. And the other thing, and I've said this for years, but I would like it not to be a one-off Test match at the Oval of Lords or Wanderers wherever. I'd like it to be uh, like a like a six weeks of Test cricket, and I'd like the top four teams to go through, or certainly the top three teams would say a playoff to go through as say they do in the IPL or whatever, uh, and turn it into six weeks um, of test match joy. And I would probably be minded to have two or even three test matches for your final. I know people say, well, it's a one-off. You would need to have your showpiece. I get all of that. But also you might just get skittle for 120 on a, on a green one that morning, or you might have two days of rain, or you might have that, that final at Southampton, which wasn't great. If you get the two best teams together and you give them three test matches, that to me is is the right way to conclude what is a three-year process to get there in the first place and turn it into a proper jamboree for test cricket. So I, I'd have always advocated for that rather than a one-off, but then I can understand why they do one-offs. I can get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I think, I, I, think it, I think it's quietly doing some good things, though. I'm a fan. I, I, I definitely think it's it's given some... I mean, the, you know, we're talking about it. There's a chance for South Africa to do well. I mean, jeepers, you know, Sri Lanka could make it. I think I think it, it just gives the game some sort of relevancy in a way that we've, we've all been desperate for. I mean, I think there are tweaks. I agree with you. Um, I mean, I would make it four years just to make sure. I mean, the fact that South Africa can make the final without playing England or Australia doesn't quite feel right. You know, I think there should be a way that you can make every team play every team. Maybe m- make it longer, make sure that there's home and away. But that again would be where if you did have a summer of it, if you'd blocked out seven weeks and you had the top four teams and it take three years to qualify, then you get those those standoff fixtures but that comes right? this all comes down to more test cricket which is obviously expensive so therefore the whole structure of cricket with revenue sharing uh with with visiting teams making some money you know the, the what wtc can only improve and get what we're suggesting if the whole ecosystem is changed right yeah and we, we i think that's actually key and we need to talk about that more so johnny grave who's, who's just left as ceo of cricket west indies he talked about this earlier this year talking about um the fact that you know you know and there, there is just an unfairness here. You know, West Indies will go to Australia or to England and um, England and Australia will make money off those teams being there because, you know, they get big crowds and they can sell TV rights, that kind of thing. And when England and Australia go back, it used to be that that model worked where, you know, you do, you know, tit for tat tours and you'd each make money off your home thing, off, off your home series. And that model just doesn't work anymore. And in some ways, not least, because, you know, you look at the teams that get sent out to these places, you know, this is, a England are doing this tour partly as a, as a favour to West Indies because of the favour they did them in COVID and then England go and send out this kind of, you know, half, you know, half strength squad and what sort of thing, how are they really paying them back? Like actually these teams, and I think England are playing Zimbabwe a, a fee next year for coming over, which is sort of a start of these things, but a standard model, yeah. which are. says, it's long overdue. yeah, yeah, which, which actually like, you know, it just, it, it, it needs a proper rethink basically like how do we, and this is the thing as well is that, you know, this this goes across the game that there is just no leadership. Like Tim Wigmore did a really good piece with The Telegraph, just basically just listing down all the ways that cricket is broken, it's particularly franchise cricket in that, in that piece, but just cricket in general. And that goes for test cricket as well, that we've basically just kind of just kind of ca- tried to keep doing the same things that worked 25 years ago when cricket was completely different and it doesn't work anymore. It doesn't, you know, make the people who need it uh the money that it needs to but there's no one who's like at the top saying like right let's all just sit down actually hash this out come up with a way that cricket looks across all tournaments all formats that make sense and you know (laughs) that's now going to have to be jay shah i guess uh so over to you jay kind of thing um and and i and i completely agree that you feel that like it's so easy to be like oh india just going to have their own interests at heart aren't they as if england and australia 
ever don't have their own interests at heart when it comes to look it it fl- it stay it remains with the players ultimately and it was always thus if the big players don't want to play it then it will wither and die and if the big players recognize that a career hitting white balls and white balls only is only half a career and they're interested by their legacy and they're interested by their place in history then the game will carry on it flows from the players they are that's where the, the power lies now i think there's been a recalibration in young players attitudes towards the game i think mentioning stubbs is a perfect example stubbs doesn't need test cricket but he wants test cricket and why does he want test cricket because he wants to be talked about in 10 years 15 years in the same way same breath as other great uh, south african batsmen. And maybe because he wants to win a, a world test championship yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, there's certainly been a shift among young english players um, there's a recognition that you can try and have one without the other, but you've got to be a damn good player to pull it off. Uh, you will never find an Australian, brilliant Australian young batter saying, do you know what? I'm just going to hit a white ball for fun because, you know, there's a few more quid in it. Nah, no chance. And you look at the, you look at the four, four sort of standout young players around in, say, of the last six months, at least in, in Red Bull cricket, Brooke, Mendis, uh, Jaiswal um, and Ravindra and they're all brilliant white ball players and they're all desperate for test match cricket um, and so look there are obviously disastrous levels of mismanagement when it comes to the fair and equitable carve up of the game's funds and not to have a test match fund is is a scandal and the complacency that permeates certain parts of the parts of the top not least in England, by the way, and I've heard some things that would make your skin crawl. But the players ultimately will, will, will make the decisions on this. And for my money, the players still recognise that that's where the real story is. Yeah. Um, and I guess I also think that that actually extends to cricket's fans as well. There's also there's this thing that people talk about. It's like, oh, that you know, people just want T20 cricket. People aren't interested in test cricket anymore. And I think I just don't buy that, basically. There's a piece that I... Um, that I always think about by by King Cricket, um, excellent writer. It's called the Test Cricket doesn't fit into modern life fallacy, and as if uh, it's a fallacy, it's, it's a fallacy that it doesn't exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. and and it basically argues that actually, in some ways, Test Cricket is the perfect thing to fit into modern life because you can kind of you you can actually dip in and out of it. You can you know you can follow it for a bit, and you can dip out for a bit, and you can come back and you can look at the scorecard and you can see exactly what's happened and you can follow it in that way. Um, and that actually, you know, there are lots of examples in other types of sports of how people like to do this. There's talks about dot watching in the Tour de France, um, you know, in baseball, people going and just looking at the scores, that kind of thing. Um, but the, the issue is, is that how do you like, and, and, and this, this comes when you talk to people as well. Like whenever I talk to anyone who likes cricket, the thing they want to talk about is is test cricket and, you know, the latest thing that's happened, you know, why have India lost this or why have... England done this and they don't care what's happened in the hundred like I've, I've never met a cricket fan who has said to me like oh why did Oval Invincibles win the hundred like people don't care in the same way but it's about like a, a, and, and it is an issue that you can't monetize it because I think people like they follow test cricket but maybe they don't sit down and just watch it for days on end but I still think those are two different things and it can be worth propping up because it is the thing that actually I think maintains quite a lot of relevance for cricket basically because like I think people that they, they just are interested like um, you know like the, the TV numbers might not show it and you know also with the franchise competition you get a game every day and that's much more easier to sell adverts for and that kind of thing but I, I just don't buy that people aren't interested in test cricket because I've not met someone who has been like a diehard 100 SA20 fan and anyone you talk to that's the thing they want to talk to about I don't know um yeah anyway let's uh <laughs> Long live, long live Test cricket and the World's Championship. Cleared your lungs there, but I guess, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. No, good man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we had a couple of minutes to finish off, but may- maybe next week we'll get into uh, James Anson the IPL auction and uh, the week in uh, in David Warner's. I saw him this afternoon. James, James Anson, Jimmy yeah, not David Warner. Yeah, no, not David Warner. They signed a painting that my mum did. Okay, of oh, him. That's sweet. Yeah, nice. for an, an auction for the the Passage Homelessness Charity next week. Lovely. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna flog that at the auction next week. Did you talk about they, the, they were about to do their their other their podcast? I can't remember what it's called. It begins with a T. Oh, <laughs> yeah, name Tonk- escapes me. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. I'm you know I said to them because they won an award this week. 
saying how proud I am of him. You know, this it's real underdog story. Yeah. Nice. The three of them coming up from nothing. Yeah. But no, he was he was in good spirits. He was in good form. I guess Anderson in the IPL auction is a bit of an underdog story. Um other 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 bit of fun was was David Warner, you know, leadership ban lifted and uh, accusing Cricket Australia of a of a ball tampering cover up, which um what from from back in the from the famous thing? No, 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 no. from now so from the India A India really? A, Australia A game, yeah. There was a, a thing on the final morning where I think the umpires changed the ball. Ishan Kishan was really unhappy about it. And then they basically said, like, actually, no, it was all fine. There was no ball tampering going on. And David Warner's now come out and says, this is definitely a cover up. And he, he, you know, he didn't say, and I would know, but. <laughs> In Yiddish, we call that chutzpah. <laughs> yeah. The absolute yeah. chutzpah of the man yeah. to, to yeah. even think about commenting. You know, God love him. But, <laughs> but totally, uh, though. Yeah. He's amazing. He certainly talked himself out of any job working in one of the cutesy little commentary boxes. Yeah, know. well, I mean, he still wants to open in the Board of Capital. <laughs> yeah, he does. Yeah, 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 I heard it. available. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. Anyway. Anyway, yeah. More that, nonsense next week. That, 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 that will do for this week, Dan. Pleasure having you on. Thanks cheers, a lot. Cheers, Dan. Thank you so much. Uh, cheers, Phil, as ever. Um, and if you've enjoyed listening, uh, please do tell your friends. Subscribe to the Patreon, maybe. Uh, and yeah, where you, Where you can hear variations on this show. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's other stuff. Greatest overseas test series wins, all that. Yes, kind of jazz. part part seventeen coming up next week. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, cheers. <laughs>